Welcome everyone to another segment of Taide and Raton. Today we're going to talk about the main lobster model. Stay tuned. What we wanted to do with this segment is to really create a new Latina narrative. Um, if you go back to the first one, you know, it's the evolution of what was uh, the Cesar Chavez Bracero and the Henry Cisneros Sleeping Giant. This is a new protagonist for the Latino community, and she happens to be a Latina, and she's a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. Then as we went forward, you know, we sort of increased the tension by adding the 60-day deadline to showcase with Jorge Ramos on the evening news. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, she had a 30-day deadline to crowdfund for an additional support of up to $5 million from her community. Mm -hmm. She lives in Torrey Pines. She's using Uzbaek to sell in Mexico. And she wants to take advantage of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement that was signed in 2020. Correct. So here's where I'm going to start giving you a little bit more information on the business that, that she's uh, currently starting up. So she was granted a holoportation patent from a rich uncle. And so... And if she you don't mind, explain the holoportation for those that don't know. For sure. So holoportation is um, defying distance. So it's a way to interact with an audience, mm -hmm. even though you are not physically present with the audience. Okay. And so it really takes two components. On the one side, it takes what, what is professionally called a production studio. Um, but really, it's just a camera, a light, and a backdrop. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you have what in Spanish is called a cabina. So you can think of it like a phone booth. Mm -hmm. um, in English, it's called a portal because it's been branded. So, uh, and that's if you're in front of the studio and the portal is in another location, you can show up in the portal regardless of whether or not you are physically there technology does that make sense yeah it does it's exciting okay. times all right so she's incorporated she's done all of her legal she's pre-sold a hundred units she has traction and and what happened was she learned from you Daide, and so i want to pass the microphone over to you um because you did a really great segment that that I hope people got a chance to see. And it was the way that you engaged with the main lobster brand. Can you tell us how that came about? Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, you know, one day I, I was feeling like I wanted to have a lobster roll. And, you know, I, I know that there are some places here in San Diego that sell lobster, but just because we're quarantined, I... I didn't feel like going out to buy it or to search for it. So I decided to do a, you know, like what most people do these days, a Google search. And I stumbled upon a whole bunch of different uh, websites in the main area that sell lobster. And that's how I found main lobster. And I ended up placing an order and was like less than 48 hours later, I have fresh lobster cooking in my kitchen. So and tell us about like how you unpacked it on the segment and you know it, what was really interesting to me was how professional it all was how it came fully branded it came with with all of these marketing pieces that uh, and like the spices in the little bag yeah I mean yeah. Um, one of the reasons why I'm doing those unboxing uh, videos is just so people can understand from other small businesses across the country, like how they are conducting their e-commerce operation, you know, from the packaging, the marketing materials, uh, you know, in, in that case, like how do they 
pack the rolls and the, and the lobster and the spices and stuff. But definitely, I mean, the reason why I'm doing those videos is because I want people, first of all, to see like everything can be sold online. I mean, I have another unboxing video where, where, I'm, where I am unboxing gelatos, you know, that, like Italian ice cream. So, I mean, if people can sell ice cream on, online, no matter what you're selling right now, you can do it too. And you can learn from some of those videos that are in the YouTube channel of the chamber. So what I thought was the most interesting about your whole entire segment was that you weren't necessarily promoting an individual. You weren't even promoting a restaurant. You were promoting almost what is a regional brand, like this concept of mm -hmm. Maine lobster rolls. Mm -hmm. And everything supported that. Like, it wasn't like, you know, they told you who the chef was. It wasn't like they told you, you know, what restaurant it was cooked at. Mm -hmm. It was that you were engaging in the experience of a main lobster roll while in your house in San Diego. San Diego, yeah. And so, you know, I, I was talking with our new Latina and and she said you know what i've been to maine and i don't know if it's because i'm mexican or not but it was horrible like the lobster that i ate in maine was the worst lobster i've ever had in my life <laughs> and i said well that's incredible because you know it's so well branded that when anybody thinks about lobster it is, um, you know, Maine Lobster is considered the best, right? Well, I'm going to tell you something just for, for uh, general education here because I cooked. I think, um, and this happened here in my house too, when I got the lobster and we ate the lobster rolls, we followed the recipe for the lobster rolls. And the lobster is already pre-cooked, so it's like boiled to the point where it's like tender, right? But... If you're coming from this area, like Southern California area, or if you have eaten lobster in, in uh, you know, in Puerto Vallarta or here in Baja or any any other uh, beach town in Mexico, they cook the lobster in a different way. So that's why, you know, when you try that lobster from Maine and it's like boiled lobster, it's not like the one that is like deep fried in a lot of like, you know, spices and stuff like the way they do it in uh, in Rosarito, for example, they, on Puerto Peñas, Puerto Nuevo. It's like, it's not like it's, it's like a steamed lobster. It's like deep fry in, 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 in oil that probably has been fried, you know, like 500 lobsters that day. So it's like that greasy flavor that you miss. So the quality of the lobster is good. And I tell you why, because the next day we have two pounds of lobster. The next day, I cook it with garlic, you know, and then this little like Mexican recipe. And my children were like, nah, you're talking about that. This is the way that we <laughs> like lobster. That's right. And so, and we had that big conversation. We said, you know, just like we're creating a new Latina narrative, the best lobster in the world, in our opinion, is less than an hour away from San Diego in Puerto Nuevo. Oh, um, like 25 minutes. There's nobody in Maine, for example, or even on the East Coast that knows the brand of Baja Lobster, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 and it's, it's a different uh, spice. I mean, what is it called? Uh, especie, like uh, flavor profile. Yeah, exactly. Different, different lobster, and it's and and I agree with you. Uh, Raton is one of the best lobsters in the world. Absolutely. But and it's not and branded. There's um we have a culture, right? So for example, and be this good or bad, if I don't have a tortilla on the table when I'm eating breakfast, lunch, or dinner, like I'm not really eating. You know, yeah. if I don't have aguacate on the table, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'm not really eating. Like I need to have certain things with my meal that are part of my culture All right. and so you know I, we're talking right now you and i about the lobster which i think is significantly better in baja than the lobster that i've eaten in maine but 
you get your beans, you get your aguacate, you get your chile, you get your tortillas. Like there's there's so much that goes along with it that actually makes it the meal. And and what's and really the experience. the experience. And that's what creates memories, mm-hmm. right? And that's why we as Mexicans, we're so tied to our culture and to our, our food is because we have all of that experience of, of eating a certain way, you know, Correct. like, and I would argue, and, and I happen to know something about this day that because I've written two cookbooks, you know, it, the European um, cuisines, especially, you know, the French and the Italian, they really dominated for a lot of years as like the go-to most sophisticated. Um, the Japanese cuisine came in with sushi and sashimi and all of these wonderful things. Mm-hmm. The Chinese cuisine came in, but like in the top five, Mexican is definitely, I would say number five of all the top cuisines in the world. Yeah. Definitely in Latin America, I think, you know, the only other two that can compare are Argentino and Peruano, mm-hmm. you know, but, but really, like, when you're talking yeah, per- the top- Peruvians are masters at um, cooking fish, seafood. Absolutely, absolutely. It's delicious. So what we did, me and the, and the Latina businesswoman, is we said, well, we have a whole network of fabulous chefs in Baja, California. And we have a holoportation device. Why don't we film a lot of content with those chefs preparing dishes? And then anybody who has the portal would be able to do touchscreen transactions of food from Baja to wherever they are, similar to how you ordered your main lobster rolls mm-hmm. and within 48 hours in San Diego, you were eating Maine lobster. What if I could do the same thing with all of the fabulous chefs that are in Baja and I'm eating it in my home in Southern California? It's that currently idea. does not exist. It's a great idea. So after she was done with all the content production and after she was done with all the social media and after she you know, got a little bit of earned media, well, that's when Jorge Ramos came calling. And, you know, now she's under that deadline to to really she wants to reach some transaction goals. Daide. And, mm-hmm. you know, for anybody who's had the good fortune to to ever earn a million dollars, it's not the way that it's talked about. Like the, those numbers are thrown around really freely. Mm-hmm. but actually do one million dollars worth of transactions is the most difficult thing in the world it is and so so that's where she's at right now with her business is she's she's done everything to prepare for the moment when the scale is about to happen It'll happen mm-hmm. an investor is going to be able to pour gasoline on on what she's created so that it becomes you know, a, what we call ubiquitous, right? Like, like turning on the light is really easy in your home while ordering food from Baja California would be really easy if this technology got adopted. Mm. I like it. I like the idea. So that's where we're at. What do you think, David? No, I think it's perfect, you know, and, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, a lot of the folks that watch this video can learn from this uh, experience in this narrative. Uh, Raton, because that's where we are. It's not like where we're going. That's where we are right now. And e-commerce is playing a key role in every business operation. And you have to start thinking globally, not just like in my hometown kind of like mindset. You have to start thinking about that. Oh, you know what? My products can have a customer somewhere else in the U.S. or somewhere else, somewhere else around the world. And if you have the, the the process in place to deliver your products around the world, your million dollar feels closer and closer. Absolutely. And you know, Taide, I have a special treat for us in the in the first segment that we did. Baja lobster. 
Uh, no, we had uh, we had Dr. Marla Parker come in and do a young female and furious narrative. Mm-hmm. Uh, YFF. I have another one for you. This is a new friend that I made in the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, we were in a program that's called Southern California Grant Makers: The Fundamentals of Effective Grant Making. And her name is Rosario Torres, and she works at a foundation here in Los Angeles. And she was very kind and very eloquent. I I call this identity poetry Mm. um, that she did for us to to illustrate what it means to be young, female, and furious. So I'll leave that with you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Rosario. And we will wrap up this segment with this video. Take a look at it, guys. For me, to be young, female, and furious means to pave the path for others. As a young woman of color, daughter of Mexican immigrants, living in the US, it means to transcend borders. To be the first, but never the last. The first in many regards. A trailblazer. It also means ni de aquí, ni de allá. Not from here, or there, but paving my own path unapologetically. It's been a journey to arrive at young, female, and furious at 30. Young, female, and furious requires a lot of courage. It means to grow comfortably with unfamiliarity, to lean into the discomfort and to be resilient in unfamiliar, unchartered territory. To be young, female, and furious means to take a lot of leaps of faith, yet trusting every decision to be the right one by listening in deeply within oneself and also blocking out all of the noise, all of the self-doubt, and to listen to the power within oneself and still come out on top while turning back and helping other women of color. To be young, female, and furious, it means to bloom where one has been planted. It's taken a lot of stumbling, a lot of learning, and a lot of growing. Today, I am arriving with a greater sense of self, reflective of my own personal journey, where I come from, and a renewed personal life mission. I hope that this reflection of young, female, and furious resonates with someone who is on their own path, their own journey to become young, female, and furious. Someone who is transitioning to their next big step, whatever it may be.